I'm going to come back to the whiteboard today. So six years, I, f- I figured this out this morning. I mean, I should have known. But literally on September 13th of 2000, on 2013 was our first service in this space. And that was after six years of being portable at Oakview Elementary School. That six years was followed by six months of when this space wasn't ready. And so um, my pastor, I still call him my pastor, his name's Mark Walker, um, he came and he preached our first service on September 13th of 2013 in this building. And I texted him this morning and I reminded him of his message. His message said um, that our best days were still ahead of us. And, um, and so, all right, just give me a minute. And so, um, so he hit me back really, really fast and said, um, and they still are. It's amazing. Timing, numbers, it's amazing how specific God is on a lot of things. Um, so the toughest thing, I'm around church planners a lot, and I, I love helping church planners. And there, there are several kind of key things church planners have to hit. Um, one, after they get to a new city, a new town, you have to be able to raise a team because you can't plan a church by yourself. <laughs> and so it, it, it took us nine months to build a team. And so we had team members that came with us. Pastor Harry and Georgetta Stambaugh came with us. Daniel and Nikki Peterson and their family came with us. Um, and we I did the math, and it, there still wasn't enough to plan a team. And so to plan a church. So it took nine months to build a team. And in nine months, that's when we figured out um, where we were going to actually land. I, 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 we found Oakview. Every school was filled. Uh, there wasn't a school in the county that did not have a church in it back then. And so um, it was, I was getting lunch, fried chicken over at Hempeck Market. I figured out in the South is the only place you can get really good food at gas stations. And, um, and so I was there getting chicken that day. And the owner said, have you, have you tried Oakview? Uh, and I said, oh, yeah, there's a church in it. And she said, no, no the, ch- the church left a couple months ago. So I immediately called to set up a meeting with the principal. And I showed up with all my sales um, that I could possibly muster. I had all of our material that was done. I had my pitch ready to go. I'm, I'm like three minutes into the pitch. And she says, Pastor, stop, please. I would, it, I would, be, it would be blessed to have a church in our school. And so, um, so I kept telling her why it was important for her to have us um, <laughs> in her school. <laughs> I promise. I mean, I mean, I just, it was like, you know, all I heard was wah, 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 wah. I mean, I had stuff I was going to get through, you know what I'm saying? And so I launched back into the, the reason why it was important for, the, for her to have us in her school. And she said, no, no, seriously, Pastor, seriously, we'd love to have you in our school. Can I show you around? Uh, okay. Um, and then she proceeded to show me where their on-site nursery was. Because in the county, they had on-site nurseries at certain schools so that teachers could drop their kids off. And I was like, okay, and uh, we won't have to buy that. I mean, that's kind of what's in my mind. don't have to buy that, right? And then we got the chairs, and I just I was really longing for a place for 150 chairs. And we won't have to buy chairs. And she walks me in the gym, and she says, oh, and by the way, we have chairs that you can use. There's no, no need to borrow chairs. And I took a big, deep breath. And I said, how many, how many chairs do you have? She said, 150. And I said, is it appropriate for me to high-five a principal right now? Is that, can, I, can I do that? Would that be okay? Um, now, uh, Denise Goodwin, she is the uh, associate director, superintendent of schools here in the county. And, um, and I believe it's because she let us in. Uh, her I'm kidding. And we're still in contact. I love Miss Denise so, so very much. And she'll probably be at our opening service. She's been at all kinds of milestones in our day. Um, but last week, we, uh, we began a series um, called Fake News. And, and what I realized is all the lies that I, I had believed over, especially these last six years, um, but I started with one particular lie that I've wrestled with the most over the last year, and that, that was the message of the, I'm, I'm a fraud. That was the lie. And that, it was a pretty powerful Sunday. Um, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read a couple things to you that I got via email and social media. Um, I'm going to go over some foundational material over that message, but I can't go over all of it. So let me really encourage you to catch that one online, listen to it, or watch. Um, this was an email I got from Joanna Jeanne. It um, uh, says, I'm, uh, Sunday, I want to thank you for Sunday's message. I love all your messages and often tell you, but Sunday, I was late. I was so late, and I was blaming the kids. 
This, at this time, it could be from a lot of you, couldn't it? Um, um, that the only seat left was on the front row, so I felt like you were talking to me. Uh, I was at the 9 a.m. service, so after wrangling the kids into the car, I was able to get home just in time to watch it again online uh, for the 11. I then called my husband, who's in Europe, for three weeks and told him he had to watch it. And then I had a cousin that was watching in Jamaica and said, you can check that off your box, uh, Charlie, if you hadn't had anybody watch it from Jamaica. Honestly, she said, I'll probably watch it again later this week. So much of what you talked about are things I needed to remember every day. The struggle is real, so thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, sharing your personal fight with the lie. While I'm in the middle of it, it's easy to feel weak and alone. Remember, I told you that, that, that when, when you're dealing so much with these lies, one of the tactics the enemy has is that, that you feel like that you're the only one that's ever had to deal with this. You're the only one that's wrestling with this right now. And so you better not open up your mouth because if anybody ever knows that that's what's going on in your mind, they'll think, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, she says, and half the time, I don't even know what to pray um, to keep my head above water. Thanks for giving us tools and for being so open. I've been, this, is, this was the one I won't read you. I've been canceling assignments the devil has on my kids and me and my husband ever since. Canceling plans like a mad woman over here. Canceling plans. I can, I can just see her. Canceling plans like a mad woman. This was a social media post for one of our college students that doesn't live here in this area. She lives out of town, but she attends Lipscomb, and she put this online. Um, boy, how important it is to welcome people who come in our doors. College student dropped off to do her time at Lipscomb. She says, I truly could not have asked for a better church home here in Tennessee. I just about cry every time I walk in the doors thinking about how kind and intentional God was in bringing me here and giving me this family because that's what they have become. The screaming pain in my head woke me up this morning long before my alarm ever had a chance. The enemy took his shot. You're in a lot of pain today. You should just stay home. And it was bad enough that I really wanted to. But I got dressed anyway. I told Jesus that I was going despite the pain, but that he had to honor that by doing something in me this morning. That my heart needed things I didn't want. My heart needed things I didn't want to leave the church the same way I went in after I fought so hard to get there. I asked. I begged him to show up in ways I couldn't deny and oh, he did. We started a new message series today, and it tackles so much of what I've struggled with these last two years, and for most of my life, really. I fought back tears the whole entire sermon, then finally found my way to the altar, something I rarely do unless I'm so moved by the Spirit that I can't ignore it. And I wept as our pastor prayed things over me, so specific that just him saying them out loud over me was powerful confirmation that God had heard my cries to him, and is in the process of answering them in ways much more beautiful and bright than I could have ever imagined. I was welcomed back last week by those, I love you and I'm here for you, I mean it kind of hugs. She was home for the summer and then was back. And by friends telling me they were glad to have me back home. Today was more of the same and I just can't get over what a gift this place has been in my life in these last 20 months. Then she finishes. His presence was so heavy in the room this morning, I still can't shake it hours later. Something changed. Dare I say something broke in me this morning. I walked out beautifully aware that he had worked on my heart, that he, met me with there, that he met me there this morning. It's the most holy feeling to be surrounded by a family who walks with you in the atmosphere shifting presence of Jesus and believes for you when you're weary, and I'm so, so grateful. Dare I say something broke. And that's what the Spirit of the Lord the Holy Spirit, it's what the Word of God can do. The, it, it can break things that have felt like they have been on forever, things that you have tried to break on your own, but not without the ability to do so. That in a moment, now it doesn't mean that you still have to, you can't, you still have, you still have to live it out, but that somehow it breaks and the dawn begins. I wonder how many times we come into this place with that kind of expectation. That's what stirred me about what she wrote. It was, I'm coming today, but I can't leave the same way I walked in. And can I say that when we have that kind of desperate posture before the Lord, we always find Him. We always find Him. He wants to be found. 
So here's how I define fake news. Okay, this was fake news defined as also known as junk news or pseudo news. It's a type of yellow journalism propaganda that consists of deliberate disinformation or hoaxes spread via traditional news media or online social media. And so the connection I made was Satan continues to spread fake, fake news. I talked about media bias. I defined media bias. Agenda elevated over truth. I kind of, I kind of broke down where that came from. Um, media bias is only reporting on the facts that support the, the, their claims, not support the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me. It's not what the media tells us that makes it biased. is what they don't tell us. That's, that's how Satan is biased. It's not what he tells us. It's what he doesn't tell us. He never tells us the whole story. He only hones in on the stuff that hurts. And although... I've said that, you know, I'm going to probably mix in maybe a few messages in here dealing with what the culture tells us and what we believe is, what the culture tells us that's lies and how to counteract that. Most of this just deals with what Satan does in our own heads. Um, we establish that all lies come from him. He is the creator of all lies. The ones he doesn't create out of thin air are the ones that he takes circumstances in your life and he manipulates those circumstances to feed you another lie. All right? So either he creates them out of thin air or he takes the opportunity to change a to take a circumstance and to weave that and spin that in a way that it's another lie in your head. And here's the thing I want, told you I wanted you to remember that the impact of a lie, okay, it's always going to rest in me because lies in and of themselves do not have any power. There are, there's no power in a lie except what I believe and apply to my life, all right? So it doesn't hold the power. I have the power. When I agree with the lie, when I give it room and space to grow and spin, anybody have any arguments with yourself in your mind? Have you had an argument with someone else and they're not even in the room? You've had it in your mind, right? Okay, so we're all schizophrenic, all right? When, when, you, when you give it room... When you give it air, you start adding to it as being legitimate. That's why Paul says, whatever is noble and trustworthy. And he said, think on these things. Because the other things, if you let circle in your mind, then they are going to take you out. On the contrary, Jesus is the truth. Scripture says that he is the way and the truth and the life. All right? He's the manner. He's the truth. He is what we look for. But ironically, even though the power of that rests with him, we still have to apply that to our life for it to impact us. The truth has to be applied even to impact us, even though all the power rests, all the power rests with him. Um, here are some of the concluding bullets that I gave last week. The, original, the, the origin of all lies is Satan. The power of a lie is in what we do with it. The intent of a lie is to control and destroy. All right, so it's a weapon, okay? It's a weapon. The power of truth is inherent in the reality of Jesus. The impact of the truth on my life is connected to my acceptance in him. And the intent of that truth, intent of truth, the intent of Jesus is freedom and life. And I concluded with the lie that I have fought with over the last year. Um, a dominant emotion connected to that lie, the lie of a fraud. Remember I said it wasn't that I felt like that I was teaching something I didn't believe and I wasn't living something I believed. Um, it, just, it just was around um, the, the core. We said all these lies. God's not enough. I'm not enough. That these, these are, these are worth-related, these are identity-related um, lies. And then and I, I, saw the, I saw this, that, that each, of us carry, um, each of us carry scars, so we're scarred. But we're also, so we carry these, we're scarred, but we're also scared. And I just noticed how similar these words were. And so when, when you're scared and then you also carry scars, then 
boy, it's amazing what the enemy can do with that realization in, in our life and how he, can, how he can flip that script. Instead of, we're all going to carry scars. All of us are going to carry them. The, the, the difference is, do they still carry pain or not? So, so do the scars just take me back to the event, or do they frame my story? I used to say this way, that a, a wound is something that I'm still dealing with. A scar is something that's done. But I, I wonder if that's completely true. Because if you look down and you see a scar, and all you're going to do is live on how that scar happened, then you're still stuck there. But God wants to take that scar, and he wants to reframe it and say, that's where you've been. It doesn't define who I am, but it does frame my story. That's the lie that I had to deal with. Now, um, I said that our worth, our worth is determined by what someone's willing to pay for us. So that our worth is always going to rest in the cross. That what Christ did on the cross is, so, so of myself, I looked this up, I'm worth about 160 bucks. If you cremate me and you, you're worth about 160 bucks. If you're smaller, a little less. If you're bigger, a little more. But basically, 160 bucks is the minerals that we have inside of our body if you just kind of burn us up. But, but God determined that our worth was his son. That's, that's a pretty big deal. So, because all of us were born after that fact, then that means our worth and our identity can't be tied to what we do or what we accomplish. It's tied to what he's done. Our worth and our identity. And here, here's the realization that hit me like a ton of bricks last week. If I spend my life trying to prove and earn my worth, I never have the time to live in it. I never have time to live in it. I never have time to explore the beauty of that, to enjoy it, because I'm continually, every new thing is another opportunity that I feel like I've got to earn that worth. And in doing so, I never get to enjoy the true worth that I have. So let me deal with the second lie that I deal with. So if you haven't figured it out, I've just turned this into my own personal confession. Um, talking, yep, this is my therapy, and you guys are going to help me work through, work through my, my therapy, okay? So, so, the, so the, I am a fraud, and the, so many of you kind of end up responding to that. I wonder how many are going to respond to this one. Here's the, here's the next lie. This one may be more foundational in my life. I'm a failure. I mean, fraud kind of deals with identity. Failure does too, but kind of failure starts out in a different way. Um, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that we're going to get through this one as well. How many of you have ever fa you failed at something? I failed at something. Raise your hand. Failed at something. So I knew, I knew that. That one's easy, right? That one's easy. Yeah, I failed at something. I broke the lawnmower. Okay, and wow. Okay, it's going to make the news. But, but I wonder who would then make the jump and said, no, I've, I've failed at something significant. And here's how I'm defining significant. I have failed at something that has changed the trajectory of my life or somebody else's. That's, now we start getting into some significant failures, not that I got a, a C on an exam or I cheated on something in college. It's, and, and so, so really what's going on here is we've got to understand that I failed is a doing problem. Okay? I failed as a doing problem, and each of us are going to fail, unless you're just really just going to sit on the couch. All right? I am a failure is a being problem. We're all going to do if we're going to try anything. But what the enemy wants to do is he, want to take, he, want to take, he wants to take it away from doing and he wants to elevate it into being. He wants to take an ed, I failed, to a you are. You are a failure. He wants to change a couple letters, 
Because a failure then stokes, what the failure adds to the target package, not just your identity. Failure adds your potential to the target pa pa package. Because if he can get us to believe that we're a failure, then we're much, much more inclined to quit something or someone. And so every time you get in a hard circumstance and you hear, I'm a failure, you've almost predetermined you're going to fail. Because that's what you're expecting. Now, I'm not trying to be pop psychologist. This is rooted in the word. Where if, 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 I, if the enemy's already convinced me I'm a failure, that when anything hard comes, I'm just going to expect to lose. Or he's not going to show up because I don't deserve him to show up. I'm a failure. Enemy always wants to take the doing, and he always wants to translate it to him being, because if I feel like I am a failure, it impacts. Listen, it doesn't just impact what you do. It impacts who you are, and it's going to start impacting the people around you. Failure. Let me see how you mark this scenario. I was a student pastor. I was a new student pastor. It was 1993, and the church that I was at had a school, about 700 students. And it was lunchtime, and I went down to the cafeteria. The athletic director was my best friend. I went down to him to eat lunch in the cafeteria. And whenever I ate lunch with students, I always ate their food. It just kind of felt like it was a bonding thing. If you have to do it, I will too. <laughs> so, so I'm in line, and, and a great, something hits me in the back. I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a high school cafeteria full of high school students, right? I mean, so, some of this is expected. Um, and then another one flew over my shoulder and landed on my plate. Well, now, now I just I got a little upset. So I picked up the grape, and I turned around, and it's not difficult to catch high school students in anything, all right? So I went to the table that was most afraid when I turned around. I walked right up to the table, and I went to the student that everybody else had given a little space around, so I knew exactly, <laughs> so I knew exactly who did it. And I walked up, and I put the grape on his plate, and I said, hi, my name's Charlie. I'm the new student pastor at uh, Mount Perrin. Nice to meet you. I think this is yours. And I walked back in line, got my food, and went about my day. About a month later, I prayed with that young man to receive Christ. He was already messed up. He was already a heavy drinker, um, which was hang, whole, uh, hiding and exasperating a whole lot of anger. And he came from a good family. He had a lot of, um, he had a lot, had a lot of things in, on his side, and he just wasn't dealing with it. It was about a month or two after that. He comes in my office during the day. My, my office was, was right off, really. It was almost like right off the cafeteria. And uh, he came in, and he had a pillowcase, and uh, he walked right past my assistant, comes in my office, closes my door. I had a glass top table, and he clanks this pillowcase on my desk. And I open it up, and he buries his head in his, face, in his, in his hands. He sits on the chair. I open it up, and there's, I don't know, a dozen, 14 beer bottles in this, in this pillowcase. And so... I just said, well, what happened? He said, my girlfriend broke up with me last night. I bought a 24 case, and that's what I couldn't finish. So I sat there quietly, and I said, is this the old you or the new you? He says, this is the old me. I said, did it work? No. Do you want to do that again? No. You ask God to forgive you. Yes. I looked at my watch and said, you're late for class. Get out of my office. Did Todd fail? Yeah. He, he got tricked. He got tricked, and so that he failed. But Todd was not a failure. So there's a lot of ways that scenario could have went. I have found that we show a lot of grace or maybe more grace to other people than we show ourselves. See, the idea that failing is doing, failing and succeeding is kind of a moving target. It kind of depends on what you determine as a failure or not, right? I mean, if you have really, really low expectations on something, then, you know, it kind of ensures the fact that you're not going to, fail. If you shoot really, really, really high, then, you know, maybe failing is more frequent. Um, you've heard, you know, the, the term perfectionist. Um, I took the Enneagram, and um, lo and behold, I'm a perfectionist. And so anytime a perfectionist 
uh, takes one of those personality things and lands that they're a perfectionist, they see that as a good thing. Are there any perfectionists in here? Right? It shows up and you go, yeah, the rest of you eight are losers, right? I mean, that, that's, how we, that's how we feel until it settles down and you go, oh, I'm a perfectionist. So here's what a perfectionist does, speaking as one. A perfectionist takes a miss and then we end up defining it for the entire mass. That miss over here now clouds everything else in my world. Everything. Every relationship, everything I've tried, it just drops everything. When a perfectionist allows a miss into a mass. And you can't ever live in any joy if you don't get a handle on that. That misses don't define the mass of our life. So this is not a message on, well, shoot lower. <laughs> just, just shoot really low and you're going to live a joyous life. You're not. You're not going to. But shooting for the stars on stuff, it's going to eat your lunch because you're not going to hit them. So, so if, you can, if you shoot that high and not let missing it make you feel like or buy the lie that you're a failure, then you just you keep shooting higher and higher and higher and higher. Because the miss is not what's going, is not going to define you. Um, I, heard, I heard this, that... Never let failures go to your heart or successes go to your head. Early on in Gateway's life, um, things were going really, really, really good. I mean, every time some new person showed up, I couldn't believe it. And, um, and then we went through, not everybody ever knows, um, so I, I'm not going to go into detail, but we went through something significant with some families that rocked my world. And I remember calling my pastor, and I said, hey, I can't believe this has happened I'm not sure how to walk through all of this. I feel like a failure. And he said some of the wisest words to me. He said, Charlie, do you know all those good things you've been calling and telling me about? And I said, I do. He said, I've got really bad news for you. I was like, thanks. Right? He said, that wasn't about you. Well, oh, come on. A little bit about me? You know, no, he said, that's not about you. He said, now I got some good news. You know that thing you just told me about? I said, yeah. He said, that's not about you either. See, I'll, I'll get to pride here at the end of the message, but, but pride is not thinking too much of yourself, right? You've heard the definition. It's thinking about yourself too much. That even in insecurity, you can be prideful because everything's going through your filter. Okay? All right, so um, failing, when failing is a process, see, I told you I'd get to it. When failing is a process, and you can see it as a process, it's a doing mechanism, not a being mechanism, um, you're going you're to reach where God has you to go. All right. You, so no, depending on where you look, um, Edison either had 10,000 um, mistakes before he got to the light bulb or 1,000. Um, I read it in different places. And when he was asked, when he was asked by a reporter, how does it feel to fail that many times, he said, no, I just think that a light bulb had 1,000 steps to success. All right. WD-40. How many have it in their garage? Can't live without WD-40. I raised the mechanics home. We had WD-40. This actually is not the blue can. This was a specialist can. Yeah, I got a specialist WD-40. Do you have any idea, without looking at your phone, what WD-40 stands for? You do? Some of you do? All right, then I'll skip it. No, it means water deterrent 40th attempt. So water-resistant silicone. So I used it primarily to break free bolts or other things that had gotten rust around where water had gotten in, created rust, couldn't move it. This kind of dissolves the rust, and then you can move it, right? But it's also used as a lubricant before so that rust won't get there. I'm going to deter the water. I'm going to deter the moisture. And it took 40 attempts to get it right. I was amazed when I saw that because I had three cans in my garage, actually. WD-40. There, there was an old... Uh, there was an old 
corporate tale that when Lee Iacocca took over Chrysler in the 80s, and he was doing this major turnaround of Chrysler, that there came a um, uh, news to him that an engineer had made a, a mistake that cost the company a uh, million so dollars. And he was asked, Lee, what are you going to do with that guy? And he said, what do you mean what am I going to do with that guy? Is he going to fire him? Of course not. Why not? He said, I just spent a million dollars training him. It's a, it's a completely different perspective on failing. And again, I, this, is not, this is not a power of positive thinking. We're dealing with what the enemy does when we fail because we are going to fail. You are going to fail. And, and, and as, long, as far as you're not going to hit every expectation of your life. And if you have to be happy, if you have to hit every expectation in your life, if everything has to go as smooth as WD-40 in your life for you to feel joy, you will never feel any of it. Because what you have done is saying that I am the determiner of joy. And as long as my power can produce these outcomes, I will live in joy. And we've never, we were never designed to, to do that. We were designed to be dependent and lean on the Lord. And so when hard comes, the enemy wants to say, hard, oh, don't you remember? You're a failure. Whoa, 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 no, no. I failed, but he's never failed. I failed, he's never failed. I'm failed, I'm not a failure because that's not who I am. I'm a follower. I'm not a failure. I'm a follower. All right? So, moving past, moving past, just try, the, the goal of the message is not just to get you to get a higher batting average. Okay? How do you feel less? That's not the, that's not the point of the message. That was the point of the introduction. It's not the point of the message. The point of the message is, I think there are at least three different environments that we find ourselves in where these feelings of being a failure most surface. And I wanna, what I want to do is I want to expose those three different environments. Okay? All right? So I think I got a slide for this. Do I feel? All right. We're going to eliminate the failure environment. They are misaligned, misalignment, missed, or missed expectations, misaligned objectives, and comparison constructs. There are the three environments. Missed expectations, misaligned objectives, and comparison constructs. All right? Missed expectations, if I just kind of drew the kind of an icon for this, you know. That's my mixed day. I'm supposed to hit here. I hit here. It's a missed expectation. Missed expectations can breed the um, first kind of little disappointment. You're disappointed, right? You didn't hit the mark. You're disappointed. If you live there, that disappointment turns into discouragement. Now, that's a little, that's a little more serious than disappointment. Because if, if courage, if we need courage to live, and, and, and encourage or someone who builds courage into somebody, discouragement is we get, we get courage sucked. It sucks the life out of us. You know, when you look up fail in Webster Dictionary, the first, the first um, definition is kind of to miss the mark. But the second one the second one is to lose strength. Wow. And so the enemy doesn't care anything about how many times you fail or succeed. What he cares to do is, is to eliminate any of your strength. Again, because then that will determine what happens next. I am a failure targets our potential in Christ. All right? So I have missed expectation. Well, what does Jesus have to say about that? When, you, when, something, when he misses an ex, one of your expectations or you miss one of your expectations, we say, God, you know, wh why, why did this have to happen? God, why, what did I ever do to deserve this? God, why am I having to walk through this? Well, we know in John 16, 33, I, I've, always, I've always connected this verse to leadership because I consider Jesus a great leader. Great leaders tell the truth. Great leaders don't hide where you are. They give you a way forward. All right, and this is what he says in John 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. What doesn't he say? He doesn't say, I have told you these things so that in me you have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I am going to take it all away. 
I have overcome the world. This it will not end the way you think it's going to end. It's a great leader. He tells you the truth and shows you the path forward. Missed expectations. Have you let missed expectations translate down into your life that you are a failure? Failure hides in the heart. Let Christ change your heart. Environment number two is misaligned objectives. Misaligned objectives. Um, there are times when you don't achieve an objective because God had never intended that to be your objective. That's a hard one to swallow. And what I believe, it is the grace of God. It is the grace of God that keeps us from achieving misaligned objectives. Because he would rather walk us through the disappointment or the pain of a misaligned objective and realigning it than he would trying to take care of us after we have already achieved that objective. Anybody with me on that? Misaligned objectives. We have to learn to trust the Lord with outcomes. God uses processes to get to his outcomes. And I believe I have spent too much energy in my life trying to control the processes to get to my outcome. And so even when you achieve the outcome, you're exhausted. And what I have found, I don't know about you, but there's so many outcomes I've looked for in my life never produced what I thought they were produced in the first place. God's outcomes always produce what he promises. Our outcomes, eh, who knows. That's an environment for hearing I'm a failure. A missed expectation is an environment for a failure. The, the third one is comparison. Comparing myself to someone else. Um, I've done, I've done, I've done really bad. I've done a lot better with this one over the years. Um, this one probably I've had the best handle on of doing my best, praying for God's will and not my will. That, that's how you change. That's how you change this one. When you pray for specific outcomes, nothing wrong with that. But when you pray for specific outcomes, you're setting yourself up for misaligned objectives. You with me? When you pray God's will. What you're doing is you're leaving the door open for an aligned outcome. Lord, this is how I see it. This is how I think it should go. No, wrong, no problem with that. But Father, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, I'm, I, want, I want your will. This is what I think it is, but this is what I want your will. And so guess what happens when the, when the, when the ship has to turn fast? When you've, already prayed, when you've already prayed for God's will and the ship's turning, you go, oh, God's turning the ship. When you're not, then it's my, sink, my, my ship is sinking. But what about this comparison thing? This is one of the main reasons why I don't, I don't spend as much time on social media anymore. before. I grew up and you had to compete with the Joneses. Okay, and the Joneses were your neighbors. Today, you got to keep up with the Joneses, the Whites, the Browns, the Johnsons, their friends, their friends' friends, and their, their cousins that live in a different country. I mean, it is... It is an enormous amount of pressure that we're in an environment where you know everything you think you do anyway. And I think when, you, when we live in this comparison trap, and I compare myself to this person, whether they succeed, what they look like, what they've done, where they vacationed, what their, their thought that they stole from somebody else and put on there is there. I mean, you know, we're always trying to compare our worst at their best. We're trying to compare our reality to something that someone wants you to believe it's a reality, and it could be or not be, but who knows? 
And we live in this world that we constructed of how we measure ourselves against one another. And the problem with that is there's always going to be someone ahead of you. And let me also say this. If you live in a world where there isn't someone ahead of you in some capacity in your circle, can I challenge you that your circle's too small? See, this is where, where pride, this is where pride manifests itself. And boy, God has a lot to say about pride. That if, if you can't read something good that someone's done or accomplished and you can't be happy for them, I'm telling you, you're living in a comparison world and it will eat your lunch and it would be the thing the enemy manipulates to tell you you are a failure. And if you get happy when something bad happens, you're living in the same pride boat. Well, I know we define pride as brash, but I'm telling you, I, I've suffered from, from, from a much different standpoint of being very insecure. That your success proves to me that I'm a failure. That's a lie that I fought a lot, a lot, a lot. Where There's no joy in living in that. It attacks your potential for God. It attacks your present for you. What does Paul have to say about this? There's, there's uh, Galatians 6, 4, and 5 out of the Amplified says this. But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior. And then he can have the personal satisfaction and the inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to, to another. For every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone is responsible. Teddy Roosevelt said, the comparison is the thief of joy. Guess where he got it? He got it from Paul. He got it from Paul. Um, I've read this, that when you spend more time counting the blessings of someone else's, you miscount yours. That stuck with me. When I spend time counting someone else's blessings. I'm miscounting my own. How do you beat, because this is a big one, so how do you beat comparison? How do you beat that environment? Two words, contentment and humility. I think these are, these become the secret sauce to break down this environment, all right? So here's Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the passage we all want to quote. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've taught it as a ten-finger prayer for as long as I can remember. We always want to do that. We always want to say, I, this is not too big for me because I can do it in Christ. This is not going to knock me down because I can do it in Christ. And the context of the passage is contentment. <laughs> Isn't that great? The context of the passage is, I can endure this because of the strength of Christ. I can enjoy this because of the strength in Christ. I can enjoy it when everything seems to be going well. I can enjoy it when everything seems to be going, it rhymes. Um, <laughs> see, I'm, how much have I grown as a pastor that I don't say everything that comes into my head? Huh? That was great breaks right there. Because contentment is leaning on the strength of Christ. It's not leaning in my own strength. Contentment is leaning on the strength of Christ, not my own strength. All right, what about humility? Again, I've kind of touched on this. Humility is not thinking, of, thinking less of myself. It's thinking of myself less, less often. That when, I am, when I'm living a proud, insecure, or brash life, everything in the universe circles around me. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you off for a loop because you're all going to measure your words every time you talk to me now. But, but no, listen, 
I love when I hear when I hear people kind of telling stories, kind of you know how you tell stories, and you know I tell Steve a story. I say, hey Steve, da, 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 and, and Steve tell Jen a story, you know, and then Harry will go, oh yeah, that reminds me of, and they launch they launch into their own story that has nothing to do with any other story. Oh yeah, that remind yeah, you know, and what well, it happens so often, and it's minor. But if we're not careful, we really buy into the lie that the enemy sells that it's all about us. That all, everything revolves around me. And so I'm going to see your story through my filter, and I'm either going to feel better about myself or less about myself. I'm going to feel happy for you, or I'm not going to feel happy for you. And that kind of deals with pride. How do we break that pride? Paul tells us in Philippians, he gives us a picture of Christ. He, here's the picture he gives us in Christ. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Here it is, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. How do you tackle pride? Value others above yourself. Being interested in someone moves the needle so much more than trying to be interesting. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I mean, this, this is the first lie of the enemy in the wilderness when Jesus is fasting. The enemy says, listen, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He, he was going after his identity because Jesus did not come to use his power for himself. The power was there to redeem his people. All right? And so he's saying, God did not consider equality something to be grasped, or Jesus didn't. He didn't want to use it to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus' humility had nothing to do with him not being son of God. His humility was, was, was that this was necessary for the redemption of man. All right, here's the conclusion. We're going to take communion together. So contentment and humility is how we deal with the comparison environment. Trust and praying God's will is how we go after the misaligned objective environment. The missing the mark. Missing the mark is always going to be a talent, a treasure, or a time issue. Okay? You set, a, you set a target. You don't hit it. It's because you either didn't have the time to do it, you didn't have the talent to do it, or you didn't have the resources to do it. So what do you do? Move on. Move on. We all have a limited amount of resources. We all have a limited amount of time. We all have a limited amount of talent. And if we miss that one, let's tee up and hit another one. Here are some truths I want to fill you with. And Chris, I know it's going to be tough getting everybody around here, but get rid of that. You are not a failure. You are strong in Christ. This is not your pastor who just loves you saying that. 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 10. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. Paul had a lot to boast about. He said, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassing great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times. Lord, why do I got to keep dealing with this? Lord, why do I keep having to deal with this? Lord, why do I have to keep dealing with this? Have you ever asked God that? Has there been the lingering things? Why do I have to keep dealing with this? What's the answer from the Lord? My grace is sufficient for you. 
For my power is made perfect in weakness. Have you ever prayed, Lord, I want your power. I want your power to shine through me. He's given a context for the pow- his power to shine through us. And it's our weakness. Paul also tells us that the all-surpassing glory is housed in jars of clay. So that his all-surpassing greatness would be seen through all of our cracks and our brokenness. A prayer for God's strength is a surrender in our weakness. And he's saying, my grace, my power, my power is strong enough for you. Therefore, Paul says, then here's his conclusion then. Well, then if my weakness is going to display your strength, then therefore I'm going to boast all more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, because then I know when I am weak, he is strong. You're not a failure. I'm not a failure. We are strong in Christ. Two, God isn't done with you or me. We are in process. Listen, and it's a good process. It's a good process. How do I know that? Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now. Being confident of this, that he that began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. We're not done. You're not done. This is a good process. God only does good things. Everything he created, at the end of the day, he said, it is good. This has been a, this is a good process. What began in you is a good thing. Now listen, we fail, but we're not failures. When we get back up and follow Christ, this process continues. And he is confident. Paul is in full confidence that we will see that completion and listen, and we all, we all won't be complete until that day when we meet Christ. God has good plans for you. He has good plans for me. Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon. In other words, when your captivity is over. He's speaking these words prophetically. I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. If you find yourself in the middle of a captivity where you are feeling like a failure, God's words for you today is, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope. See, when, you're, when you feel like a failure, there ain't any hope around for miles. And you definitely don't think anything will ever change in your life. But Jeremiah, as a prophet, says, I will give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray, and I'll listen to you. Last one, Deuteronomy. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. When we stay a follower, there's no way we're a failure. To live that lie keeps you on the sideline. Here's the last thing I want to tell you. I failed is past tense. Don't live there. I am failing is present tense. You can still change your present. I'm a failure is nonsense. That's mine. Thank you very much.
It's nonsense. It is not true. We're going to take communion last Sunday in here in worship. But the cross was seen as the quintessential failure. It was the quintessential failure. And it turns into the quintessential victory. That, that's what Jesus does on the cross. I mean, if you've been around it a while, it's, it's easy just to go, yes, Jesus won on the cross. But if we're there in the moment, there is no coming back from dead. There's no coming back from dead. There's no coming back from the kind of shame that he experienced. There's no coming back from that. If we're there in the moment, it's done, it's over. And it was, right until the time it wasn't. Some of you need to hold on. You need to hold on. You're ready to quit something. You're ready to quit someone. You're ready to quit yourself. You need to hold on. Because we serve a God who makes a way where there was no way. That's what resurrections do. So when you receive the cup, Remember, it's going to be in two cups. The, the, the bread's going to be in, in the juice. The juice is going to be embedded in the cup with the bread. You take both cups. The bread cup represents the body of Christ broken for us, beaten for us. The blood of Christ, the juice represents the blood of Christ. Here is the altar response today. The altar response today is if you have been convinced that you're a failure, if you have quit, or you're in the process of trying to quit something or someone. When you receive the body and blood of Christ, Scripture says that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Receive, receive the hope of the Lord today as your response to this lie. All of us will fail. None of us are failures. Ushers or elders, whoever's going to come serve the community, please come quickly. Just ask that everyone would just hold the elements until that everyone has them and I'll lead us in receiving communion. Father, we thank you for your word and its truth. We thank you for your son and his power. We thank you for you and your love. We thank you for the spirit and his ability to speak deep, deep, deep truths into our lives. Lord, I have no way to know all the scars in the room. Lord, I have no way to know all the fear in the room. But what I do know is that I, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, provide that kind of resolve today as we receive your body and your blood in the name of Jesus. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my
standing where y'all are. Keep y'all standing instead of... All right. I've already spilled my communion. Any more in there? I'll catch it next service. Here we go. Matthew 20, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Let's take the body of Christ. he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. Here is the hope. We are not a failure. Let's take the blood.
Lord, in this holy moment. Lord, I believe you are, you have been, you are speaking into our hearts. We live this life, Lord, not as a life of hype. That's not what was displayed in this room. It was signs of hope. Lord, we live in your hope. And it's because of your hope that we can raise our voice and we can shout, we can raise our hands, Lord. It is is because of hope. We thank you for the hope that you redeposited in our lives today. guests with us today. It's been great having you as part of our worship service in this building. Um, Let me also say, if you want to find a place to pray before you leave, please do. Up here is probably the best place. Um, But um, please don't let the enemy snatch what he plants in your life on Sunday morning. Um, If you are a guest right outside these double doors, there's a team of people who would love to get a chance to meet you. Um, I don't do this often, but um, uh, Johnny's in the back. Johnny was at work on our building this morning at 7 a.m. He, he works with a subcontractor dealing with the fire safety and those kind of things, and that's one of the things we have to have done to get a TCO and a temporary, uh, a temporary occupancy permit. And he was on, on the job at 7 o'clock this morning. He was on the job all day yesterday and decided to come over and join us for worship today. And, Johnny, it's great having you part of our service today, brother. We thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the work. Now for the benediction. Don't uh, before the benediction. Next Sunday night or next Sunday, what time? Okay. All right. Let's. I'm gonna see how many people I greet next Sunday at 9 a.m. out, out front. <laughs> now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make His face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, and you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you guys. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.